Hi, everyone. Apologies. We are having some technical difficulties at Roundhouse, but no worries at all. My name is Gabrielle Hoyt, and I'm the literary manager of Roundhouse Theatre. I'm hosting the weekly series Playwrights on Plays, which is part of the Roundhouse at Your House digital programming, fully funded by new contributions from the Roundhouse Board of Trustees. Every Thursday at 7 p.m., I'll be spending an hour interviewing a different Roundhouse-affiliated theatre maker about their work, their career, and a play that has influenced and inspired them. We'll also include time in those interviews for your questions, which, if you're watching live, you can type into the chat window on your screen. Each play we discuss is already free online for you to experience, so that you can continue to engage with theatre from your home throughout the week. Tonight, I'm so excited to introduce one of the artists we'll be featuring in our 2021 season, Octavio Solis. Octavio is a nationally renowned playwright, director, and author whose play Quixote Nuevo, a magical and music-filled adaptation of Cervantes' classic Don Quixote, transposed to the Mexican-American border, will begin Roundhouse's fall season. His work Mother Road, a sequel to the classic Grapes of Wrath, was recently seen in DC at Arena Stage, while his book Retablos, Stories from a Life Lived Along the Border, was published in 2018. Tonight, Octavio and I will be discussing his life, work, and a play he knows very, very well, Edward III, which he translated for Oregon Shakespeare Festival's Play On program into modern English. As a reminder, if you have any questions for Octavio, feel free to type them into the chat window on your screen at any time, and we will address them at the end of the hour. And welcome, Octavio. Hello. Hi. How are you? Hello. I'm very, very well indeed. Thank you for being with us this evening. It's my pleasure. I'm so glad to um, be able to help out in this and so where, where are you coming uh, to us from tonight? I'm coming to you from my farm. This is my studio in my farm mm -hmm. uh, out in Southern Oregon, about 20 minutes outside of Ashland. Uh, mm -hmm. The mailing address is Medford, but really we're out in the woods. I, I got that sense. That's amazing. I'm, really uh, I'm in very, New Jersey, so. <laughs> it's been very good. I mean, it's really splendid isolation. Um, so it was easy to quarantine ourselves. We got a meat locker uh, filled with meat that we had from uh, a cow that we went half on with another uh, filmmaker and his family. Uh, we are growing our own crops here. We have milk from our goats, eggs from our chickens. Um, so we're doing all right. So you're going to bring us a lot of, of food and drink gifts at, at Roundhouse in the fall is what, I'm, is what I'm hearing. I hope so. I hope, <laughs> I hope to do that. Um, so speaking of, of life right now, that is where I'd like to start our discussion um, in that every artist, I think, is is dealing with the, the current situation in, in the world and in their own way. And I'm curious uh, what your take on it is, what it looks like for you to be an artist at this moment. Well, I think uh, for me, I, I know nobody wants to not be working Everybody needs to be bringing in uh, the money so they can live, so they can provide for their families, so they can pay rent and their utilities and, and be able to maintain their lives. Um, but I kind of needed the break. Uh, mm -hmm. For me, this came at a really, really uh, needful time. I ran myself dry uh, and, and my inkwell was dry. I couldn't, couldn't do a lot of writing. I was exhausted. And uh, and so several projects got canceled, and you know I, I think of them as, as just being waylaid for a while, postponed. Mm -hmm. We'll get back to them. I'll be able to uh, uh, give myself fully to them. Uh, but in many ways, this is a sabbatical that was enforced that I I, I think I, I I really needed to um, to honor. What had you been working on that you were finding uh, so taxing? Uh, well. Um, Actually, doing the book tour for, for my books, uh, to go from book festival to bookstore, and then also work on multiple productions. I've, had, I've been working on Mother Road, both here at the Oregon Shakespeare Festival and at the Arena Stage. Mm -hmm. uh, there was a three-pronged um, production of Quixote Nuevo uh, that involved the Hartford Stage Company uh, in, in Hartford, Connecticut. Um, the Huntington Theater in Boston and the Alley Theater in Houston. I was involved. I went to all three productions. I made tweaks along the way to uh, on the play. Uh, 
and all of this came roughly at the same time. So it just drained me. On top of that, I wrote a new play uh, that uh, I'm uh, called Scene with Cranes that I'm uh, going to produce for CalArts, for the Duende Arts program. Uh, and, and we had hoped to do a workshop this next month in May for a premiere at Red Cat in, in LA in the fall. Of course, that's not happening now. Um, but we, we're, we're sort of working on, 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 the, on the assumption that at some point it's going to happen. We just don't know when. Everybody's kind of operating on that question mark. We're all living in that I don't know zone. Um, so uh, for me, that was that was the chief thing. I've been doing research on, on a number of plays, specifically one for the arena that, I, that I'm writing, a commission to work on a play um, that deals with the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo that was signed in 1848 that basically made the Rio Grande the border. Mm -hmm. And to me, um, that is uh, an important uh, landmark moment. Uh, I'm a child of the border. I was born and raised in El Paso, Texas. My parents came from Mexico. They live still in El Paso. We live, uh, our, our home, our childhood home, uh, was barely half a mile away from the Rio. So um, I have a real interesting, complex relationship with that river and, and that border. Um, and so to write a play about that signing and what it meant and to, to the communities living in Texas at the time, um, it, it's been very interesting. There's been uh, a, a lot of research I've been doing through the arena at the Library of Congress, and, and they've been extraordinary in their oh. assistance there. Uh, with, with that, I, I'd love to move on to a little bit about you as a playwright, because uh, because you've already mentioned how something I think is so extraordinarily about much of your work is, is that um, while it often focuses, uh, as as you say, on um, a very specific uh, area of uh, like physical area within the country along the border. Uh, it's you're you're done nationally. I mean, just all over in California and DC and Hartford. Um, and I think that's so interesting. And I'd, I'd love to hear you talk a little bit about what it is you, you think about your writing that makes it uh, resonate in so many very different uh, areas of the country. Well, I've been writing about this since I sort of finally came, had my come to Jesus moment when I realized that, oh my God, I'm Latino. And I shouldn't be writing imitations of David Mamet and Harold <laughs> Pinter. I should be writing about my culture, about who I am. And uh, when that happened in the, I'd say, late 80s, mid to late 80s, everything changed. Uh, and I became so specialized uh, writing about that zone uh, uh, north, uh, north of the border, just along Texas, uh, with such a sense of, mission um, that I felt that this would be uh, uh, easily understood and, and grasped by all theater companies and all people, all the audiences across the country. That did not turn out to be the case. Only those, those states that have uh, uh, Latinos of, of my background, Mexican background, really were, showed any real true interest in those works because they said, we have an audience uh, that comprises uh, that is comprised of, of Mexican Americans, and we're dealing with those border issues now. Mm -hmm. uh, of course, in other communities, it just didn't happen. Didn't happen in New York for a, for a long time, for decades. Mm -hmm. But uh, a certain president has really made it his cause. He's made it a, a hot, a hotter button issue than it always was. And suddenly, my works rose in prominence and be, and and gained a kind of uh, relevance. Mm -hmm. that uh, that actually they should have had before. Yeah. Um, so I, I didn't change the the the, the times caught up caught up. And yeah. On on that on that uh, note, something I'm I've been curious about reading a lot of your work uh, in that uh, it it certainly feels like you are are drawing on things that are are very personal and that have to do with with lived experience. But at the same time, um, given how politicized conversations about 
the border have become? Do you consider yourself a political playwright? Um, well, Gabriel, um, I, I don't. I, I don't consider myself a political playwright or, or didn't mm -hmm. um, until our president kind of forced the issue. Yeah. There have been uh, so many uh, other groups that have expressed their vehemence against people of my background, uh, especially people who are undocumented, who have very few resources fighting for them, that I felt enough's enough. I have to take a stand. These are days that require us to take a stand. Um, but it also forced me to look back at, at my plays. And even though I, I tried to st stay away from politics, the politics were always there. Yeah. And it just took a while for me to kind of cop to it. I, I, I always said I, I'm not a political writer. And, and uh, my colleagues, dramaturgs, directors, actors would say, oh, well, not according to what you say here in this play, <laughs> not according to what you depict here in this one. Um, I just, I just, you know, where I was living before, um, when I was running these plays in Dallas, I knew who my audience was, and I knew what I was writing, you know, who I was writing against. I knew my enemy. It's a very large conservative audience there, uh, or, or population in, mm -hmm. in Texas. So I knew my audience there. Uh, moving to San Francisco, the audience became suddenly very, very liberal. And so I felt like, well, I'm preaching to the converted here. How can I turn it on its head so I can push push their buttons as well? And uh, but now I feel like you know uh, the the times call for us to really take a stand uh, because the other side is taking a very strong, vehement, fiery stance, and they believe in their cause. And so it's it's time for us as artists. To also stand up and uh, and be counted, uh, or else we're just going to roll over. Yeah, and yeah. they roll over over us. Um, I I think this is a really interesting conversation to to bring to bear, uh, specifically regarding Quixote Nuevo. Um, given uh, given that uh, a couple things. First of all, that Roundhouse is thrilled that we're going to produce it, but also that it's it's interesting in in that it's experiencing kind of this um many uh resurgence in that it, it came out and was it was quite successful and and now once again we're about to see multiple productions of it across the country um well, when i first wrote it it was a commission by the oregon shakespeare festival and i'd been to spain i would had the novel i'd read the novel uh and they asked me to uh do an adaptation of it and i said do you want contemporary solis treatment you know and they said, no, we want uh, more of a historical costume drama, something we can do in our outdoor stage for general audiences. Mm -hmm. And so I said, OK, I can do that, too. And and I took it as a point of pride that I tried to be as true as I could to Cervantes' uh, uh, version of uh, the original uh, novel. Um, I read two additional uh, adaptations. The the really wonderful English translation that was done in England around 1780s, 83, by Thomas Smollett. Um, and it's in the Norton Anthology also. Excerpts of it are in the Norton Anthology of English Lit. And then the other one was a more recent one. It was recent at the time, anyway, when I started mm -hmm. doing it, uh, by Edith Grossman, yeah. who was a wonderful translator. Uh, she also did a translation of Love in the Time of Cholera and is well known for her translations of Gabriel Garcia Marquez's novels, as well as other novel, other novelists in South America. She's a tremendous, tremendous scholar and wonderful poet in her own right. And, you know, and the way she uh, has translated into English these beautiful Spanish words. So I read both of them, and they were both very instructive. It was clear that I could only do book one, and, uh, and, and even then only a few episodes of book one and try to find the narc in it. But in trying to be true to the novel, I also uh, kind of hamstrung myself as a playwright. Uh -huh. the novel is um, picaresque. That is, it's a series of adventures, episodes that are almost interchangeable uh, with a hero that undergoes all these trials and doesn't change. Mm -hmm. 
Don Quixote doesn't change at all. He only changes at the end when his when he just sort of finally admits that he's tired and he's going to pretend that they're taking him to see Dulcinea, but he's just going to go home and rest. <laughs> um, and um, and so I try to be true to that. And so scholars who came to see it, Cervantes uh, fans and fans of Don Quixote would find that I was true to it. But um, there was something that was innately, theatrically, dissatisfying about it. Mm -hmm. um, even though the play did well, I just, even the lead actor who played the role was really struggling and very frustrated because I just didn't give him an arc. I didn't give him an arc at all um, because there isn't one in, in the book. Um, that changed when I was, I, and I put the, the, the play in mothballs. I had a few invitations to try to do it other places, and I just said, I'm not ready for this just yet. Um, and then finally I was induced by Shakespeare Dallas to adapt it uh, again, set it in more contemporary times, uh, set it along the Texas border, and make it more bilingual. And mm -hmm. I was excited by that. I said, fine, let's, let's do that. Well, we did, but, but I generally still worked with the same plot that I had before. And the same problems arose. Again, my lead character changed very little in the course of this thing. So it was difficult for the lead actor to find something to hook onto, a, a journey where he would change. Um, and, and so there was something that I just wasn't quite there yet. Mm -hmm. But I was close. I was in Texas anyway. I had left Spain and I was now in Texas. <laughs> then Eric Ting uh, at Cal Shakes asked me to do it one more time, like the following, within a year, said, I would want to do this play, but I don't think you're finished yet. Mm -hmm. uh, and so I have a director for you, KJ Sanchez, the three of us, we're just going to sit around, have a lot of coffee, talk, have a lot of beers, smoke some cigarettes, and some cigars, and uh, we'll hash this out. Well, uh, they kind of led me to a point where I felt like, you know, I really have to rewrite this play from scratch. Mm -hmm. And I really have to make it mine. That was Eric's uh, suggestion. Uh, almost his, his, his command. He said, you have to take that novel away from Cervantes and make it yours. What's your stamp on it? Make it yours. I'm not, I'm not interested in doing Cervantes. I'm interested in your response to Cervantes. And um, I came up with this conceit that feels like I'm being tr both true to the spirit of the novel, sometimes to the letter of the novel, and yeah. yet it's a completely new work that feels like me. So I was really excited to kind of embrace that and embrace it fully to bring in my Mexican culture, my indigenous culture, right to, to, in, into play in this in a way that does not feel European yeah. at all. So, and, uh, and that feels uh, innately theatrical, uh, too. Totally theatrical, with a character that has an arc, mm -hmm. uh, an arc where he discovers things about himself as he moves along. And then I could address the things that are important to me, the things that have to do with, with my culture, with I mean, political issues like immigration, the wall, et cetera, uh, but also things that have to do with identity, uh, memory, uh, how memory works with identity, how uh, memory works with love, that, that as long as we can remember, we're capable of love. But once memory is gone, then love, it's difficult to love. The organ of love is 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 isn't the heart it's it's our memory mm -hmm. who the moments we remember with that person and playing that out in, in this play became so much fun and then also dealing with calacas the skeletons uh the the figures of death and death as a figure that guides cervantes through these adventures through his adventures it just made sense that's what made it uh, a play of the Americas rather than a Spanish play. And I had tried to write in, I did in fact write in Cervantes as a character in the, in the, in the first version, uh -huh. because uh, in reading the novels, anyone will realize that the most interesting character 
in the novel isn't Cervantes, it isn't Quixote, it's Cervantes, it's the <laughs> author, who's constantly interrupting the narrative to remind people that, hey, you know, uh, it's just a book. <laughs> it's just a book. You should take all of this with a grain of salt. I don't know if this adventure ever really happened. Um, I'm just I'm just relaying to you what I read in a book. Uh, so he, it's very meta in that way. Yeah. And I tried to do that, and uh, by by introducing Cervantes as a character in that, and um, and it didn't quite gel. Not until I changed Cervantes into Death, mm -hmm. then it made sense. I think people are very going to be very very excited about this play now. <laughs> um, I was especially excited to talk to you about um, kind of the project that we're doing regarding uh, talking to amazing playwrights like yourself about classic plays, because one of the things that I notice again and again and again in your work is that even you know when something is an adaptation. Um, like Quixote Nuevo or like Mother Road, which is not quite an adaptation, but more of a sequel to Grapes of Wrath. But even in um, your plays like Lydia or Santos and Santos, which um, aren't classical adaptations, but but have almost this, this uh, large sweeping scale, especially when it comes to um, emotion, when it comes to family drama, there's something that feels uh, in uh, incredibly almost, I don't know, for me, felt very much like Greek drama. Um, and, and where I'm going with this long-winded question is, I'm curious to hear your take on with something like Quixote Nuevo, what is the power, do you think, of adaptation uh, to speak to modern concerns and modern topics? And we'll then, we'll use this to, to talk about the play that uh, we're meant to talk mm -hmm. about, Edward III. Well, I, I think, um... As we start to move more further away, um, unfortunately, from the written word to the visual medium, um, I see the culture moving more that way. Um, I, I, th I think a way to kind of um, make those works that we didn't think were that relevant, that are, that are not that relevant today, to make them feel more that way is to kind of place them in the hands of, of contemporary writers to so that they can either adapt them or translate them or, or give them a kind of, uh, uh, um, give them a, a different look just so that we can all realize that those works, what makes them classic is the fact that they are utterly contemporary, that mm -hmm. they still matter, that they still are resonating and are still telling us so much about who we are as 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 humans uh, on 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 a uh, on a plane where we're all mortal, where we're, we're all going to be born, we're all going to live and suffer and die. Uh, that's the thing we all share, and it, it, from the beginning of time, uh, and um, and there are some insights and lessons that these wonderful works of literature have that w will seem startling uh, and fresh and new. Uh, but sometimes it takes um, other writers to kind of come and, and make them, uh, bring them to these audiences. Mm -hmm. My, uh, you know, in, in adapting Don Quixote, my hope is that not only will people uh, come and laugh and enjoy and weep it with with my characters in my play, but that they will also um, be induced to go to the library and find or, or or go to Amazon and buy Don Quixote to buy a great translation and immerse themselves again in, in, in for the first time even in those books, it's because we we used to think of those books as stuffy, uh, and and I thought when I first read. Qu when I first opened Don Quixote, I thought, oh boy, here goes a really stuffy read. Here we go. <laughs> and I found it so funny. Mm -hmm. It's a comic epic. And it's one of the few books that exists, uh, one of the few works of literature that, that qualifies as an epic work, yeah. but is a comic epic. And there's so few uh, works 
of, of that, that operate on the epic level that have that kind of humor. Yeah. And uh, that's what made this, this book so special. And it's also meta. It, it, it truly is meta in, yeah. in a way that makes, that makes it feel utterly contemporary. So, um, so I find those works really, really fascinating. And I think we have, it, it's on us. It's on us as writers to try to bring those works, sometimes kicking and screaming <laughs> into the 21st century. So um, with, with that, let's talk about a, a, a perhaps less well-known classic, Edward III. Uh, for those, for those who maybe <laughs> haven't read slash heard of Edward the Third before tonight. Can you give a little synopsis of of the the plot of Edward the Third and also what what is this play? It's Shakespeare, <laughs> kind of. Yeah. It, it, even the the history of its being included with Shakespeare's works is such an interesting one. Well it, it's a, it's an early play uh that has just been uh, I think of it as, as Shakespeare's latest play. Um, but also probably one of his earliest plays. Mm -hmm. uh, it was first performed around 1592 um, and published uh, two, three years later after that in its own volume uh, without any author credit. And there's a lot of uh, other works by Johnson and Marlowe and even Shakespeare who had some quartos that were published anonymously without any author credit. And this was one of them. Um, and um, um, it's uh, uh, it, for for many years. It was considered a work that was uh, probably written by Thomas Kidd uh, or another writer like Thomas Kidd, mm -hmm. with some help some, from Shakespeare. But someone ran a um, um, plagiarism software program through it through this work, and discovered that yeah, there's probably a little Thomas Kidd, but there's a preponderance of Shakespeare in this work. Uh, and so it was determined by some scholars that it should be included in the canon. Yeah. Uh, and so it's there. The, and, and it's really about, uh, I think I think of it as a kind of propaganda play um, that's meant to glorify the uh, first campaign of Edward III when he, became, when he was king, um, his first campaign into France, thus initiating the Hundred Years' War. And also, um, and for those following along in their history, play, lexicon, knowledge, Edward III in chronology, uh, historical chronology actually sits right before Richard II, Henry IV, Henry V, Henry VI. Richard. Right. So, he, like, I mean. Like the prequel. But, yeah. And so by the time uh, Shakespeare wrote this play, and I do think it's a Shakespeare play, mm -hmm. uh, by the time he wrote it, uh, it had been like 300 years since Edward III. Uh, win on this campaign around like 1446, something like that, um, and uh, and 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 thus started a war against France uh, that involved other nations as well that lasted not a hundred years but more like a hundred and twenty years. Uh, it was a long, brutal campaign, <laughs> ugly campaign, um, and so it's really about him and his invasion, taking his son, the Black Prince who is just knighted and sent into battle and has to prove his mettle in combat and does so several times. Um, it's, um, it's, it also, uh, there's an there's, there's a entire act, Act 2, deals with him, uh, with, with Edward III, repelling the Scots uh, out of north, the north of England and spending some time uh, with the Countess of Salis Countess Salisbury in the castle, in her castle, Roxbury Castle, mm -hmm. uh, and uh, and there they kind of have uh, a romance. It's really more of a one-sided romance, mm -hmm. um, where he uses his power as king to induce her to promise to make him happy, no matter what it may be. That she promises she'll make him happy, and of course she is. Um, that's her king, and she says anything I can do to make you happy. Uh, I will do, I swear to you. Uh, he makes her swear. And he says, okay, then, then you must sleep with me. And that's where she says, nope, sorry, not doing that. And says, you must, you swore, you promised. Uh, but she reminds him that I made a promise to my husband. You made a promise to your queen. Uh, so we have to, you know, 
way back and uh, then gets her father involved in it, her own father. And as you know, he, you know, he, Edward acts, acts all miserable and, uh, you know, the, the dad goes up and says, what's wrong, my liege? What can I, what can I do to help? And he says, well, um, I'm just miserable and, and nothing can make me happy. He says, well, if there's anything that I can do to make you happy, to relieve you of this misery, I, if it's in my power, I will do it. I swear. And he says, so you, you, you swear? <laughs> you say, yes. Good. Get your daughter to sleep with me. <laughs> And that, that for me was when I firmly moved Edward III into my Shakespearean sleazeball category. Oh, yeah, <laughs> there's, totally. There's, there's totally. some really interesting but aspects of interest. so smitten with her, and he yeah. wants her. And uh, she finds a way out of it. Yeah. And again, using the very same techniques that he used on her. Um, this play uh, is all about oaths and promises. It's about vows and the weight of a man's word. Yeah. Uh, man's word was his honor it meant everything everything so when someone gave their word they had to keep it and they had to weigh their own personal word against their loyalty their promise their fealty to their king to their country to their flag um to one's father uh to one's brother to one's wife all those promises are weighed and 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 dealt with um uh, as as in a way that made it feel really like this is a true Shakespearean work, yeah. Um, because it just it just got naughtier and naughtier as you went along. Um, um, the, re the the thing is is that even though this was a, a a what I think of as as a play meant to glorify him, he was kind of the Edward the Third was kind of the George Washington of his time mm -hmm. uh, for us. It's been. 250 more than that 300 years almost since uh george washington you know was active in our in the history of our nation uh and it was that almost that long if not longer um and so he was highly revered and they needed a work that would glorify him but there was that one naughty issue mm -hmm. there had been a rumor that he had raped the countess salisbury or that he had had an affair with her or that he somehow had used his power to kind of, you know, uh, hit on her mm -hmm. in, in an unsavory way. And rather than ignore it, Shakespeare chose to embrace it yeah. and deal with it in a way that made the, made the, the king look deeply human mm -hmm. and deeply flawed. And in the end, he, at the end of that episode of that act, he kind of realizes just how wrong he's been and immediately repents. Um, but not without some assistance from the Countess herself. The Countess has to find a way to make him bow out gracefully. Because mm -hmm. he could chop off her head easily and he doesn't. Um, and immediately turns his attention to France. Yeah, to yeah. going there and fighting this campaign where he can then decree himself the rightful king of France. But so, all, uh, those, all those promises get dealt with in that whole war campaign thereafter. Yeah, yeah. The Countess is never seen again, but uh, her, that episode resonates throughout the entire play. So I'd, I'd love to fill folks in on the reason that you are so intimately familiar with this play. Uh, oh. uh, and, it's and it's because of... Um, the play on program at Oregon Shakespeare Festival in which you translated this play into uh, modern English. I wonder if you could tell folks a little bit about that program uh, and, and what the experience of translating Shakespeare from the English to English was like for you. It was, it was like taking a beaker of water and pouring it into another beaker of water <laughs> and, uh, and doing this. Um, and it had to be that delicate. Uh, I took the task quite seriously, and uh, I chose Edward III because I was I, I was convinced that if I didn't know it was a Shakespeare play and ha and wasn't familiar with it, the chances are nobody else would be either, uh, and there wouldn't be people sitting in the house uh, when the play is going on with their volume of Romeo and Juliet up, going, "Okay, what's he going to do with this line? What's he going to do with this line?" 
<laughs> Nobody's going to care what I did with the text in Edward the Third, except for scholars. Um, but I still had to take the task really seriously. Um, at the top of the uh, of of the rules was first do no harm. If the text is working already and it's beautiful and it sings and it just transcends meaning and goes to that other beautiful, wonderful place that we associate with Shakespeare, leave it alone. And there's a lot of that in this work that I didn't touch. But there's a lot that I did. Um, the second thing is honor the, the meter Mm -hmm. as much as you can and honor the the verse where it rhymes it make it rhyme and honor the the thematic metaphors that are working throughout mm -hmm. so i've worked with all those things i'm not allowed i was not allowed to update it i was not allowed to cut it i was not allowed to adapt it or to fix it and you know i think there's a lot to fix but i was allowed to kind of uh um uh, in some ways, I felt like I was just clearing the weeds. Mm -hmm. uh, it was really dense, difficult language, and there's a, uh, and, and sometimes uh, Shakespeare would show off by uh, um, by just creating not just one analogy to a certain situation, but five. Um, well, I had to include all five because I'm not allowed to cut it. Hmm. But there's ways in which some of the language just gets so convoluted uh, as he's, I think, really trying to figure out how to work his craft um, that I just felt like I could clear that up a little bit. Yeah. Um, my task, um, as I saw it, was to make myself invisible, hmm. to really make it feel like pe all people were listening to, all that they were hearing was just really, really clear Shakespeare. It's a fascinating project in that, as you say, it, the, the point is not adaptation. And in fact, when you when you look at the the, the work side by side, it, as you say, it's it's line by line that that you were shifting, translating, whatever verb you want to use the text. But at the same time, it's that the point is not to make spark notes Shakespeare. I mean, Oregon chose some of the best playwrights in the country to to do this. So I mean, it's just. It must have been such a fascinating process for you. And I'm curious if there was anything in spending so much time uh, with a Shakespearean text, if, if your own uh, understanding of or relationship to your own playwriting changed, was there anything that surprised you or, or that shifted for you uh, as you worked on this task? There's a lot of lessons I learned uh, from doing this. Uh, um, that I felt like, you know, I can apply this to my work as well. Mm -hmm. And one of those is that as a poet, and this is a work that almost, yeah, the entire work rhymes. Not not rhymes, but the entire work is written in, in verse. A lot of it's blank verse, and a lot of it has some couplets at the end, or has some interesting internal rhymes, um, and uh, other little, little poetic um, uh, tools, chias, chiasmas, Mm -hmm. is in there a lot. Uh, I think that's how you pronounce it. Um, and uh, But the thing that I really, really responded to was this idea that this guy cheats, that he <laughs> cheated, that he cheated on the verse, he, he cheated on, 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 on the, the meter. It is, he, he pretended, he made us all believe it's all written in iambic pentameter, but he, but he cheated constantly. Sometimes some of the lines had nine verses. Sometimes they had 11. Sometimes they had 13. Uh, and sometimes, in order to make a rhyme work, a character's name had to be pronounced differently. Mm -hmm. Like sometimes it's Salisbury. It's two syllables, Salisbury. But sometimes it would be Salisbury. So he would accommodate it so that you had to spell out the entire word. So um, he also cheated in terms of history. He foreshortened history and told, uh, but this is true in all of Shakespeare's works, mm -hmm. but I found this especially true in this one. He, he did two years in, in two acts, and sometimes, you know, one scene, he'd like, you know, they're about to go to battle, there's a sea battle that's about to start, Mariner says, here we go, and then he goes, and then they hear some cannon fire, and then the Mariner comes back, and, and then he has a report about how the sea battle went. 
and it's like in 10 minutes <laughs> and all of that happens in 10 minutes a raging sea battle that took days he it, it all happens in like less than 10 minutes mm -hmm. all in this beautiful descriptive verse um so I, I i feel like when i'm writing with history that i should give myself those those kind of permissions yeah. I, I feel I, I also feel that like he took what he needed from history and then what didn't work dramatically just chucked it mm -hmm. just chucked it without thinking twice but other stuff that seemed really interesting he kept he kept uh because of its theatrical possibilities for its humor sometimes um he also he also started introducing a lot of the uh, ideas that he really worked out later in in his stories. Um, so um, it sort of made me relax about my own work, about my earlier work, because mm -hmm. I see now that really what I've been doing uh, in these plays that I thought were like oh so dreadfully flawed is that I'm working out some things, some mm -hmm. themes that I'm still pursuing today. But I'm clear-headed about it now, having wrestled with them over several of my plays. Something else um, that was uh, yeah. something else that was very interesting. I, I think reading uh, Edward the Third for the first time, uh, and then going on a deep dive through your work, uh, again noticing, as you say, how much of Edward the Third is poetry, and and how much you were able to preserve that, um, and then you yourself are an incredibly lyrical language driven multiple languages driven uh playwright and, and and so it felt in some ways that you were so suited for for this play and as you say the kind of flexibility of of language within the play uh given that what a a tool language feels like in in your hands and i was just wondering if if uh, thoughts on that and and, and in thoughts specifically from you uh about uh your your relationship to language at this point in in your career as an artist well i was an actor for a number of years and i took shakespeare i studied shakespeare and i studied with somebody in in england that really uh his his whole notion was that there are no accidents that everything that shakespeare wrote he wrote on purpose so if there if, if it has a a, a dangling end to it if the ending is weak rather than ending on, on a strongly accented word that there's some reason for that that he did it to help us with with something we're working out as a character with something the character to use it in that way so uh, he you know he just imagined that Shakespeare was this, this genius who worked everything out really precisely um, and I'm I, and so I come from that school mm -hmm. uh, that if if it's like this, it's because he Shakespeare intended that. And I'm a student of Shakespeare and a student of, of literature on, on top of that. And I also read so much poetry. I, I, I do love language and I do love poetry, both uh, uh, ancient and, and contemporary, mm -hmm. modern and, you know, 19th century, whatever. Of any period, I love poetry, and I I still read it. I still buy chapbooks all the time from poets I don't even know, just so I could drink up those those words. Um, but it's my background in, in as an actor that mm -hmm. really made me appreciate uh, these these works, these works that 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 uh, are so lyric, that are mm -hmm. so beautiful, that elevate a character so that you know. Um, he could be a pauper, he could be a fool, he could be a villager, but when he speaks, he speaks like a king. He endowed all characters with these large and large souls. And uh, that, that's, uh, that I found really very, very useful, very useful yeah. in my own writing, uh, but also useful in, uh, in, in, in acting out, acting Shakespeare. Mm -hmm. uh, working on translating this work i felt like i when i sat down i was putting on his gloves and getting to work and and doing it line by line trying to make that meter work because i had to make some changes in it and i still had to make it work i could feel what he was going through and it was amazing 
because as I was doing it, I was referring to online thesauruses. I have rejected thesaurus up here on my, on, 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 on my shelf. I've got dictionaries. I've got all of Shakespeare's plays, which he didn't have at the time. I've got all these lexicons. Um, and he had none of that. Mm -hmm. He had none of that. There was no ED for him to like, what's the word for this? What's the word? If he didn't have the word, he just made it up. He created language, yeah. the English language. It was, uh, that's what I find extraordinary about him. Yeah. Is that he, uh, when he didn't have, when, when, when the language was insufficient for the things he needed to express, for his characters to express, and it had to fit the meter. Mm -hmm. Yeah, sometimes he cheated, but sometimes he cheated in the most beautiful way. And that's by inventing language. Yeah. Inventing words. I wanna I wanna stay on the the um the topic of, of Shakespearean language briefly, and then we're gonna turn to questions from viewers. So folks who are watching, feel free to continue uh putting questions and comments into our live chat on your windows. Uh but for you, uh, one of my, my last question uh, is um, right now, given that uh, it is suddenly uh, more or less impossible to access live theater in this country, um, if one is if, if finds Shakespeare enjoyable, if, if one enjoys either reading Shakespeare, they're all free online, or watching Shakespeare, you know, the Globe, the National Theater, RSC have all made their archives very inexpensive or, or entirely free. Uh, it, it opens up so many possibilities. But I think for a lot of people, the idea of Shakespeare, because the language is so rich, so thorny, so complex, can be really intimidating. Um, and I'm curious if you, uh, as a student, a scholar of Shakespeare, someone who has worked with these texts so closely, if you have any advice for people who maybe are hungering to engage more with theater, who really miss it, but who find Shakespeare difficult to uh, to grasp or, or to access. Um, don't fear the language, don't fear it. A lot of times the uh, frustration comes from just being uh, afraid of it. Uh, l learn the music first. Learn to say it as music first. Learn the music of it, um, and then, and then go back and then look at what it means. Um, that's how I ended up in, in uh, being an actor. I was thrust against my will into a drama one hundred and one class as a sophomore in high school because my art art class that I really wanted to get in w w was already full. So I was in this drama class and I did not want to be there. And the first thing she had us do is read Midsummer Night's Dream. And we went, you know, we're all Latinos, we're all Mexican American kids. And this is all new to us. And I would I could see people struggling with it. And I'd be looking at it and going, like, I I, I can see why he's struggling, but wow, to me, this I, I get it. I get the flow. I get, I don't know what it means. But I think I think I get the flow of it. So when it came my turn, I just launched into it and I pretended, pretend that I knew what I was saying, and uh, I could feel the teacher doing, you know, like what? Who's that? Who's that? <laughs> and she called me in and she said, "You have to audition for my fall play." And the rest, you know, that's all wow. she wrote. <laughs> I, wow. I became an actor after that. But it's because I just didn't. I, I decided not to turn away from the language, not to think of it as completely irrelevant and to, to my life. Um, um, I, and also the other thing is, is that um, I thought of it as metaphor. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I got it. I understood there was something innately that, that, that I understood about it. And, and I said, this is a metaphor. It's a metaphor for my life. No, I don't live like that. I'm not a king like that, but I get it. It's a metaphor for the way we live today, for the, how, for our lives, uh, and it and and I, I said it's somehow still resonating within me. I get something. I understand something. I ended up playing bottom when they produced it the next year. <laughs> and it was so wonderful, so <laughs> wonderful. That's yeah, I, I wish there were photos of me in those tights. You know, we all have those loose tights. <laughs> <laughs> and that silly donkey head. 
Um, we have got a question uh, from from Bonnie Hammerschlag, uh, who is curious uh, about the books that you've written. Do you want to Do you want to give a quick? Uh, sure, sure. Let me get one. Your books. Oh, we're doing show and tell. <laughs> show and tell. Yeah. Okay. Well, uh, I have um, uh, some of my plays are out in in Samuel French form, and there's an anthology called the River Plays uh, that is published through uh, No Passport Press. Thanks to Karidazovich, who's been marvelous in publishing so many people. So I have some of my works uh, that way available. But the, the thing that I'm really proud of now is this book called Retablos. And Retablos is, uh, uh, these are stories that I wrote about my personal life growing up in El Paso. They're um, kind of like creative nonfiction. They're, they're true stories, but I gave myself uh, permission to misremember some things. Because if I if I didn't remember them very clearly on the fringes, I I just said I'll just make it up. <laughs> uh, and so there's a there's an element of fiction in them. Mm -hmm. uh, I uh, so the book ends up getting filed sometimes in fiction and uh, cultural anthropology and uh, memoir or nonfiction. It's it's all of that. But um, but but I, it, it's an interesting sort of hybrid of all those of all those things. Mm -hmm. And uh, I've, I've got a number of these stories. It was published in, I'm sorry, I'm trying to find how to fit it in. Here we go. It looks great. Uh, I, uh, I, it was published by City Lights Press uh, pub Publishers in uh, out of San Francisco. Mm -hmm. uh, and I was very, very honored to work with my editor on that. It was a, a whole new thing for me. I'd never written anything like that before. I, although I started quietly writing these stories about 10 years ago. Mm -hmm. And just kept them in a little separate folder, and they were just for me. It must be, must be interesting to switch from memoirist fiction-ish brain to playwright brain. Does that feel it very is. different? But some, you know, um, what I remember when I first started writing plays, and how I couldn't. I had two jobs, and uh, I couldn't. I was teaching and then bartending at night. And every spare minute I had, I just couldn't wait to sit down and start writing. And then I made a career of it. And so this is all I do now. Um, but it's my job. Mm -hmm. So sometimes I needed my own uh, uh, to take a break from my obligations, my commissions, and just write for myself. And so I wrote, would write these things uh, late at night when I was tired or had writer's block or something and just write them for myself and then work on them quietly. Um, and uh, I accumulated something like 25 of them. And then when uh, the editor of a literary magazine in San Francisco called Ziziva asked me if I had an excerpt of a play I could submit to for him to publish, I said, I don't have anything new that uh, I'm willing to share now, but I have these stories. Can I offer those? And I said, send them in. And I just thought he was going to reject them out of hand. <laughs> he loved them. He loved them. And he published uh, six six of them, set eight of them. And uh, when the issue came out, he says, I'd love for you to read them, read some of these at the inauguration of our release of this issue. And we're going to read it at the Poetry Room at City Lights. And I thought, oh, my God, I've arrived. <laughs> I've hit. Because to me, uh, you know, as someone who grew up studying City Lights and that whole beat poet movement, mm -hmm. it meant a great deal to go up to that poetry room where, you know, Allen Ginsberg first read Howe, or mm -hmm. Lawrence Ferlinghetti, who founded that books or read Coney Island of the Mind, or Anne Waldman read her poetry, um, and where uh, so many other, right, Kerouac, all these guys came through there. Mm -hmm. um, have read in that poetry book, poetry room. Yeah. So um, I read there and it was wonderful. Uh, but that attracted the attention of the people at City Lights and said, hmm, you got more of these? <laughs> and I said, nah, I could drum up a few more. And uh, they said, when you have what you think is a book, send it to us, call us. Wow. And they were serious. And I did. And we got the book. Came out in 2018. That's amazing. Um, I'm very, very proud of it. All right, we've got another question for you. Which contemporary playwrights excite you right now? Oh, wow. Well, uh, 
my uh, my colleague uh, Luis Alfaro is one of them. Uh, he's doing some amazing things. Also tapping into classical literature from the Western canon, uh, Greek tragedies. Um, so Mojada is a powerful sort of retelling of the Medea story. And it's uh, really, really amazing. Um, it's funny, but in my, in my screen, my voice is not connected to, I'm, I'm gonna I'm, wait till they catch up. I'm, I'm seeing, I'm seeing that too, but you know, we, like, we're three minutes to the, we're going to yeah. be fine. Yeah. There I caught up, <laughs> you caught up. Um, uh, I think it's cause the screen periodically on my computer goes black and what? that causes a lag. So what? as long as I keep the cursor moving on here, it'll be fine. <laughs> um, so he, I find really exciting. Uh, I also find uh, the works of Lauren Gunderson really, really thrilling. She's a colleague of mine from uh, San Francisco, where I used to live, and she's like the most produced playwright in America. We love Lauren. Yeah. Understandably so. Writes with a sense of mission, uh, with such clarity, and she's just incredible. And Peter, Peter Noctree was another one who I find really exciting, and he has a wonderful satiric voice great sense of humor uh, and uh, he's crafting some new works a, a new work that is a, a response to us being locked away uh, for untold days mm -hmm. um, number of days um, so he I, I find him also very very thrilling uh, from my early days my inspirations are uh, Irene Fornes Maria Irene Fornes is a is was was a, a mentor and a teacher to me and her work still excites me whenever I see it. Uh, Sam was also a big one, Sam Shepard. Uh, so I, he's, he's high on my list, mm -hmm. mainly because he wrote about the Southwest. And I'm, from, I'm a child of the Southwest, uh, of, of the desert Southwest. I'm from El Paso, Texas. And so when, he, when I saw plays that were about that, region that wild still wild region of america i really connected with it i really did so he's a he's a very powerful uh, influence still thank you for this this reading list uh <laughs> so uh we've got a minute left but i do want to get to this question because it's such a great one uh from roundhouse theater so i'm guessing our wonderful host and apprentice johnny has a question for you uh, you talk about the music of language. Do you play any music? Do you see connections between modern playwriting and songwriting? What a great question to go out oh, on. Gosh, yes, yeah, yeah, I, I do. Uh, I don't personally play any instrument. I sing all the time. Um, I think that there's so many stories that we can draw from uh, all the songs we hear. My present uh, uh, muse for that is Bob Dylan. Mm -hmm. I think Bob Dylan tells so many delicious stories in his songs that are like crying to be to be dramatized in some way. I think they're just crying. And especially from his later era, from his later period, starting with uh, uh, with Time Out of Mind, his album Time Out of Mind, that it came out in the mid 90s. Uh, Time Out of Mind, Love and Theft and Modern Times. Are, are, and Tempest also uh, is, uh, is one of his last albums, um, are, are just brimming with story. And that's what I, that's what I like about hearing, hearing his, his tales. It's, it's not the ballads that I'm drawn to, uh, although they're beautiful as well. It's the ones where he, where he connects to story and tells a, a kind of, uh, I mean, a real ballad, a ballad in the, in the formal sense of the word, where somebody's telling us, singing a story. From, um, and that from goes there. to an old folk tradition that goes back, you know, to the Middle Ages. Yeah. So from Cervantes to Shakespeare to Dylan. <laughs> um, those, those are my models right there. Um, uh, Octavio, I'm going to briefly preview what we've got going on next week. But before that, I want to say goodbye, good night, and thank you so much to you. Oh, I hope uh, it's and good. and be safe and enjoy your mead and and your house and and your milk and cheese, uh, and and we hope to see you at Roundhouse in the fall.
Thank you. I love your bookshelf behind you. Thank you. you it's my mom's that. and I alphabetized it. Oh my gosh. <laughs> I got to do that with mine here. Just it's a process. It's <laughs> Have a, a process. great night. All right. Thank you. It was my pleasure. Thank you so much for tuning in for this episode of Playwrights on Place. If you'd like to read Edward III, you can do so online for free at a link that we'll provide. This series will continue weekly, Thursdays at 7 p.m. And next, we'll welcome Tony Award-winning playwright J.T. Rogers as he discusses another Shakespeare play, Julius Caesar. Thank you to our tech support, Johnny Monday, composer Matt Nielsen, and the Roundhouse Marketing Department. In the meantime, I encourage you to check out Roundhouse's website for additional digital content. And if you're financially able, please consider a donation to the Roundhouse Resilience Fund. Your contribution will be matched dollar for dollar by our dedicated and generous board of trustees up to $100,000, meaning that a gift now will impact RH team more than ever. Be well. Take care of yourselves, and I'll see you next week.